Welcome to Cut to the Chase, where we talk about compelling legal, regulatory, and public interest information and news. Your host is Greg Goldfarb, an attorney, entrepreneur, investor, and activist. All right, folks, time for our favorite podcast, Cut to the Chase. And I'm cutting to the chase. I'm bringing back Marcus Susson. How are you doing today, Marcus? Greg, how are you doing? Excellent. Doing Marcus is a rising young star in the world of mass torts, and he's come on to talk about other mass torts. But one of the most popular ones that he's on leadership, meaning like, you know, he's kind of steering the ship, is this Ozempic, Wagovi, weight loss stuff. Um, I know a lot of you are like, that's the last thing you want to hear is that this thing could cause you problems, but you better pay attention because they really, the manufacturers, I think, have not warned about the types of problems that these drugs can cause. They can be very effective, I've heard, but there's some downside that you need to be aware of. So Marcus, there are updates on this case. Why don't you give us a little background about the case, where, where it is, who's it in front of? Is it a mass tort? Is it an MDL and all that stuff? Take over. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, jumping right to the the meat of it, I think you hit the the nail on the head, Greg. I mean, I don't think anyone's really questioning the efficacy of these, what they call GLP-1s. I mean, they're effective, right? They uh, increase insulin and they slow down your digestive tract, telling your brain that you're not hungry. I, I think of them as a synthetic hunger hormone. That's the way I think of them. Um, but going back to the, the, the efficacy of it, the drugs work, but what this case really is all about is, do we know the actual risks that are involved? Are the patients and the doctors fully informed of the risks involved? And I, and I don't think they have been, and we don't really have to look too far back to see that. I mean, these are relatively new drugs. For example, Ozempic came out in 2017. Since then, their, their warnings have been updated in 2022 uh, for gallbladder issues. They've been updated in 2023 for ileus or intestinal issues. In 2024, this year, we know that the FDA is evaluating reports of suicidal thoughts, hair loss, pulmonary aspiration. And then even more recently, um, studies have come out linking semaglutide, the active ingredient in Ozempic, um, to permanent blindness, a disease called NIAM. So that kind of begs the question, do we really know everything about these drugs? And looking back at that short history, I don't think the answer is yes. So I think we all just need to slow down before we you know, buy into this whole media blitz of this being a miracle drug. Okay, so... The drug was approved by the FDA. I want to kind of go through the, uh, cause I'm a little confused. Originally the drugs were approved for diabetes, but they're being used for weight, lo weight loss. How is that? How can that be? Yeah. So, I mean, there's different variations in, in peptides used. Uh, but if you think of them, they're all GLP one um, drugs. That's the old, the category there's Novo Nordisk uh, has three variations of it. Eli Lilly has three variations of it. Um, and more and more manufacturers, now that they see the money involved, are all coming into this, this kind of GLP-1 market. Um, but the history of, I guess, semaglutide, let's take that for example. Um, Ozempic came out in 2017. That was for diabetes. Um, after that, I believe it was in 2022 or shortly thereafter, um, uh, Novo came out with Wagovi. That is for weight loss. So there are different medications. For some, some are used for diabetes. Some are used for weight loss. Now, earlier on, some doctors were prescribing the diabetes drug for people just to lose weight, and they didn't have diabetes. And that's when you heard about the shortages and all that. Um, but now we have semaglutide, Wagovi being used for weight loss. So it was just a natural kind of progression of, um, you know, the same ingredient. It's semaglutide. Um, it's the same ingredient um, being used once for diabetes. Now I've got approved for weight loss. All right. So just to kind of simplify the case, uh, you're, the, suit, the lawsuits are against the manufacturers and it's for failure to warn about these potential 
medical conditions that can be caused. So that you're talking about the blindness, the hair loss, the the GI issues, gastroparesis, and all that kind of stuff. Do I got that right? So currently, right now, the main injuries in this consolidated litigation, the main injuries are gastroparesis, which is stomach paralysis, um, ileus or intestinal blockage, um, and gallbladder issues. Now, I think because these studies have recently come out regarding the um, the nigh on the blindness, that injury will get added in. But as we stand right now, the main injuries in this consolidated litigation are the gastroparesis, ileus, and the gallbladders. All right. So a bunch of these cases have been filed, and then they get consolidated in front of one judge, and they are designated a an MDL, multi-district litigation. Yep. So that's what happened in this case, just like other pharmaceutical drugs. We see it um, because there's thousands of cases filed across the country um, and people have uh, used the same drug and have been injured by the same drug. The federal court systems essentially consolidates everything in front of one court. Um, in this case, it was a court in the Eastern District of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and that's where the cases are right now. And who is the judge that's handling the case? That's uh, Judge Marston. All right. And so how approximately how many cases are in in this consolidated type of litigation? So right now there's about a thousand cases filed, although, you know, I, I think that will dramatically increase, you know, somewhere. God, golly, it's it's kind of hard to, to guess, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it went over 10,000. Wow. Claims. All right. It, so it, it's, it's an early it's an early litigation right right now, but that number is going to dramatically increase. OK, even though it's an early litigation and one of the reasons we're bringing you back to talk about it is that there have been updates in the litigation this week, uh, Science Day. So why don't you explain to everybody what that's all about and and where we are in the case where, you know, what are the like the next basic steps that take place in these kind of cases? Sure. So I guess Science Day um, is one of the first steps that usually happens, doesn't happen all the time in these multi-district litigations. And if you think about it, these federal court judges in these court systems, they sit over and have to hear and decide, you know, very scientific technical issues of all different kinds of, of drugs and, and products and designs. And they really, the courts have to be, become experts in these little niche, uh, niche um, industries. Um, it's frankly a monumental task. And then you add, add on top of that, they also have to sit on a criminal docket, right? So they also have to become experts in this, this criminal procedure. So a science day is essentially um, more of a, uh, less of a legal day and more of a science day to kind of have the parties educate the court on really how the drugs work in this case and how they can cause these certain injuries such as gastroparesis, ileus, and, and gallbladder issues. Um, and that's what went on uh, a few days ago here. All right, and so basically you make a presentation of what, how these drugs cause the gastroparesis and the manufacturer's attorneys explain to the judge the opposite, that, that you're somehow or another wrong. That's exactly right, yep. I mean, none of it's really evidence or anything like that. It just provides a nice springboard um, for the court, really, and, and for, you know, everyone in, that's in the courtroom. So they know and they have a, a kind of a background to jump off of. Um, because, again, I I don't know how the courts the courts do it, but, I mean, all federal courts, they have to become experts in all these little injuries, which to me is, is a, a, a shocking task, but they do it. All right. So if there are people out there that have, you know, suffered GI issues and have taken these weight loss drugs, maybe you didn't even realize there might be some connection. It's not too late to get involved in the case. No. Yeah, actually, it's it's pretty early. Um, the case has been going on, you know, under under a year now. So it's it's really it's relatively early. And, and frankly, I think it's relatively early on these on what injuries this drug is going to cause. Yeah. Um, I mean, since 2022, you know, we went through a little timeline there just with those Ozempic. And, you know, it seems like every year, you know, the, the warnings or the instructions for use are getting updated or there's studies coming out or the FDAs are looking into um, 
certain uh, reports that are being submitted. But, you know, I think the, the main message and the main takeaway, at least from my perspective, is, you know, before we buy into this big media blitz of this miracle drug and all the great things it can do, I think we first need to be fully informed of all of the risks, our doctors and the patients, because then we only then we can make an informed decision as to whether to take this drug. Gotcha. All right. So why doesn't the manufacturer just do what you're saying and, and put a warning label that, you know, the Ozempic can or, you know, Wagovi can cause gastroparesis? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, the manufacturers, the pharmaceutical companies, they can update their their warning labels. Um, why don't they do that? I mean, I think in some instances, instances we've seen Novo Nordis do it. Um, interestingly enough, the warning labels between uh, Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly are a little bit different. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, uh, I hate to say it, but in my opinion, I think the pharmaceutical injury kind of looks at that as a kind of risk reward decision where they kind of have to balance, you know, do we want to warn the public about this as opposed to scare them off from using our product? Yeah. So basically it comes down to money. They don't want to lose patients because they know that whatever they're taking might cause serious issues. They're just going to yeah. hope it, cross their finger and, and hope that it does it. All right. So what's the roadmap from this point forward? I know there's like legal issues that the court will have to decide. And I guess the court at some point is going to have to decide whether uh, the su science supports your theory. Yeah. So one of the things that the court did um, early on in this case is the court decided to uh, essentially deal with two issues up front or, you know, early on in the litigation, I should, I should say, and that's a, uh, a legal theory called preemption. And then also whether a certain diagnostic test is needed to uh, essentially diagnose one of the injuries in the case, which is uh, gastroparesis. So as far as a timeline and a stage, those are kind of at the, at the head of the, the timeline, if you will. But then at the same time, once your lawsuit is filed in the court, there are certain um, questionnaires that the, the, the plaintiffs have to fill out. Um, they provide medical releases to get uh, to give their records over to the other side. And there's certain discovery, which is essentially documents going back and forth, um, sometimes in the millions of documents. Um, so that'll be going on, especially as it relates to those those two injuries up, or those two issues, I should say, up front. All right. Gotcha. All right. So I think that's, you know, maybe we'll check back in three to six months. Maybe there'll be more updates. Uh, you know, if you're out there and you're taking these diet drugs and you're having all these wacky uh, conditions and, you know, your stomach is bothering you, you can't see, you're losing your hair, uh, you know, give Marcus a call. I'm going to put his information. Marcus, what's the best way to way to reach you? And I'm going to make a note of this myself. Yeah, no, the best way is via email. It's marcus at sussinlawgroup.com. All right, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. And, you know, maybe you're an attorney out there and one of your clients, you know, has an, and you're like, what do I do with this? Marcus, do you like, ref you accept referrals? Do you do co-counsel with other attorneys? On these yeah, of course. I mean, that's, you know, it's pretty standard in the legal industry. If, you know, some lawyers do certain work, others don't. So that's kind of a nature, nature of our business. All right. So it, yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. it, Greg. That's it. All right. All right. Listen, this is, you know, he's one of the young rising stars in the world of mass torts. You're going to see a lot more of him, especially on, on cut to the chase. Uh, Cause that's where it all happens. Thank you for coming on short notice, Marcus. I know that, but you did me, you know, I knew this was, you know, ripe and all that. And, you know, I know you did a great job and he was actually, you know, on leadership for this case, which means he had to apply. The judge selected him over, I don't know, a thousand other candidates. So this guy's the real deal. All right, Marcus, I can't say anything more nice about you. That's it. All right, Greg, enjoy. That's all for this episode of Cut to the Chase. But before you go, will you open up your podcast app and give us a five-star review? You can also leave a comment about what you liked most or other topics you'd like us to cover. And please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming shows. Thanks, everybody. Be safe out there.